Today we're going to talk about a guy named Paul Ansel, and his girlfriend is Nicola or Nicola Bully. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, as of the date of this video, Nicola has been missing for two weeks, and the show that this comes from is a UK Five interview or UK Five program called Vanished. Where's Nicola Bully? The vast majority of people watching on, Nikki is a face on a poster at the moment. Tell us a bit about her. You know, what's she like? She is um, fun. She is loving. She is, if you're friends with her, she's the, the most loyal friend that you could ever have. You know, she, there's, what, with Nikki, what you see is what you get. There's no hidden, nothing's hidden. You know, it's all, that's, that's her. And she, she is an exceptional mum and she absolutely, you know, adores our girls goes above and beyond I, I was say, saying to Emma the other day I don't, I don't think that she's been away from them like for more than like one or two nights you know since since you know we've had you know our, our eldest and yeah. she uh, yeah she um, just a, a pillar of strength you know to, to our to our family and uh, without her You know, the, the hole is, you know, bigger than you could possibly imagine. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so what's she like? And you instantly get some self-soothing on the leg there. He moves his palm up and down the leg repetitively. This self-soothing, I think we're going to see is quite a baseline for him. Uh, the other baseline I want you to look at is, do you think his tone is optimistic or pessimistic as a good generality? He is going to self um, evaluate himself later on in this video as being an optimist. But what do you think? Do you feel his tone is optimistic or pessimistic just keep that in in mind the hole is bigger than you can possibly imagine there at the end and then we get contempt i believe now is that contempt for his uh his girlfriend or is that contempt for the situation that he's in one thing i want you to think about and it's important when we think about something in body language called a fellow's error which is when um uh, some of the signals that come up in a situation you mistake for another situation that you have a bias around. If grief is the situation that he's in right now, you have something called the stages of grief. One of those stages of grief involves anger, resentment, and blame, and eventually bargaining as well. We're going to see what I believe is bargaining later on as well. But I think the contempt here is the contempt around anger, resentment, and blame. Very probably for his missing partner here. To have resentment and blame and anger for your missing partner is a standard element of grief. And it would be easy to mistake that for something nefarious when it's actually part of, of grief. Uh, that's all I got on that one. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, guys, I, I, I love my wife and have zero doubt in who she is. And if she disappeared tomorrow, I would immediately be like something is up. However, there's a ton of other stuff that enters your head. A ton of other stuff is going to enter anybody's head. So when we think about that, it's what happened before. It's did I have a part? There's all kinds of things that are going to go through a person's head, along with that anger and all those pieces around grief. So what I want you to, to know is, first of all, there's no magic in what we do. We can't read this guy's mind. We're not trying to. We're not mind readers. We're basing on lots of experience with people what we've seen in our experiences what we've seen in body language, what we've seen in behavior, and we're using what's normal for him in this conversation and when it deviates. So let's start off by talking about what's normal for him. A lot of people use their forehead to connect with other people. There's very low head or awkward forehead involvement with him. So very low or awkward forehead involvement with him. I have worked with autistics and with Asperger's in the past, and it's one thing I noticed with them. So there could be a possibility somewhere on the autism spectrum, don't know, possible. But his style certainly has less forehead involvement than most folks we see. When he's talking about her, he drops his eyes down into the right. 
And while there are no absolutes, we typically associate a person when they're thinking of emotional facts, think of some yourself, as having their eyes drift down into their right. He smiles as he describes you in present tense, good both indicators. He punctuates with his brow as much as he does when he says you could ever have, the best friend you could ever have. All these illustrators we're talking about is when a work person punctuates their thoughts with their hands, with body language, with some kind. Then there's something in there I associate with an unarguable fact. When a person closes their eyes, shoulder shrugs, and pulls their head away, that's an unarguable fact to them. It's just not, they're not in intake. They're not going to listen. All of his illustrators, all of his hand use, all of those things are at the right time as he's speaking to punctuate his thoughts. Those are good. He's got adapters where you said he's rubbing his thigh mark and we're going to watch that and i'm going to show you later why i don't think it's in response to stress other than the basic stress adapters are things that make the unfamiliar familiar to us so we do this we may do something to comfort ourselves and because they comfort us they also can become a habit quicker than any other thing so what we're going to look for here is a cluster of behaviors that indicate something rather than looking for that one adapter will he rubbed his thigh or he touched his face chase what do you got i agree with you guys and one thing I want to say that there's there's emotional accessing when he's thinking about what she's like. His eyes go down and to his right, which is where we humans look when we're thinking about emotional memories. We're recalling something that's truly and genuinely emotional. There's a few single shoulder shrugs here uh, during this interview that we might expect to come out in these genuinely grieving people that we might see that those precise points this constant self-soothing adapting behavior on the leg is something that i want to point out here we see this in response to stressful situations or a desire to you know get comfortable because a person doesn't feel comfortable it's a natural reaction stress does not always mean deception so the one thing to take note of here about this self-soothing behavior has nothing to do with the stress or the behavior at all. And I think it's more important than both of those things. And there's no, uh, the, the key thing is here that there's no compulsion for him to control it or hide it or prevent it from coming out. This shows us there's no internal desire to control stress responses, which suggests we're dealing with someone who isn't trying to force a perception on us. The moment we see someone trying to control stress, we're seeing someone with a high degree of anxiety or we're seeing someone who's fully letting go and letting those signals come out. And we're seeing that degree of fully letting go, which is a good sign for the videos that are coming up. Scott. I think that everybody's really hit on some good stuff. Mark, you're talking about the Othello error. And I think that's in Ekman's book, uh, Emotions Revealed. I think that's one it is. If not, it's in one of the, it's one of the, in one of the biggies. That's a classic. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's real important here. And Greg, you were talking about how important the baseline is as to what we're seeing and all, and how important that is. And, and Chase, of course, you nailed it with, with all the stuff you're talking about. In this first video, let, let's pay attention to what we're like we did last time. Let's pay attention to what we're not seeing. Because most of the time, what we focus on is someone who's done something, and quite often we know they've done it. So there's no big secret there. We're not pulling off some big magic trick. We're just showing you the things that pop up usually when someone's not being honest. And we can take all the ones where we know somebody's lying and look at those and say, and compare them to somebody who we don't know if they're lying or not, and start comparing to how many um, of those same cues we see in the other person, right? So that's that's what happens. So with your experience in doing this, that's where you get to be uh, skilled at it. And you can say, well, I think this, and you can, and, and you can actually teach other people to do that. So it's from the experience of actually doing it, the years and years we've all studied and read studies and done studies and been part of things and been in those experiences. That's what gives us the, the, um, the perspective that we come from. So you're, you're right on all that, Greg. It's, it's, this is not someone so far that we're looking at that is showing us uh, deception. For example, in this video, everything is is as it should be for someone who didn't do what they're in in question of or being questioned about. You know, and this guy isn't saying, "Did you kill your your girlfriend or whatever?" He's not saying that. But a lot of people on the internet think this guy, all the armchair, you know, body language people saying, "Yeah, he did it because of this, this, and this." But we're not seeing the things that tell us that he. We're not seeing the the cues of deception 
or cues of hiding things or cues of guilty knowledge that we would usually see in those videos. What he's talking about isn't comfortable to talk about. And that's why he's rubbing his leg, like Greg was saying. That's 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 an adapter. He's trying to get rid of that built up stress and tension. Any, as Joe Navarro says, any repetitive behavior is a pacifying behavior. Any repetitive action or thing that you do, whether it's this or this or keep doing this with your eyes, those are repetitive behaviors. And that's how you get rid of that built up stress or tension. And that's what we're seeing throughout all these videos. It gets a little bit more intense as it goes, but we'll talk about that when they get there. His arms are open and his legs are open. And he's kind of, he looks almost relaxed. So that's going to bother a lot of people too, but that's okay because he's, he, we're not seeing any, what we term barriers. The barriers are anything you put between you and the, and the other person. It could be your arm like this. It could be a, a pen or a coffee cup. It could be anything, anything to put just to, so you can get some space or something between you and that other person. It doesn't mean you're being deceptive. It doesn't mean you're telling the truth. It's just, you feel uncomfortable and you want something there. He doesn't want anything there. I think he's trying to get out everything he possibly can to help with this situation. So that's why he's sitting that way. And he's, and the interviewer is sitting at an angle to him. They're not sitting straight on. So it doesn't seem uh, confrontational quite often. And for me, an in interrogation, that's the way to do it. Some people want to sit straight on to him and, and do it like that. So when you, for me personally, it's like sitting at, if this was a table, you'd sit here or the person would sit here and you'd sit down here somewhere. So you're at an angle, you're not confronting them. When you walk up and talk to somebody, if you guys, when, when guys meet each other, they don't stand there straight on and talk to each other. You know, so they'll turn sideways. Nah, yeah, yeah, but because it it's not, it's confrontational. When, it, when you when you first meet them, because we as an animal take that as aggressive behavior. So he's not looking for as he's talking, he's not looking for ways to be that he's being boxed in that he's not paying attention to. He's not looking for those things to say, what's this guy saying? He's not locked in with wide eyes and really still everything he's doing. He's moving very fluid, very smoothly. Everything in this first video is as it should be for a person who is uh not guilty of what most people think they're they're guilty for. A lot of people think they're guilty for. He's not hiding anything. I'm not seeing anything as far as the deception goes. The eyewitness is you. For the vast majority of people watching on, Nikki is a face on a poster at the moment. Tell us a bit about her. You know, what's she like? She is um, fun. She is loving. She is, if you're friends with her, she's the, the most loyal friend that you could ever have. You know, she, there's, what, with Nikki, what you see is what you get. There's no hidden, nothing's hidden. You know, it's all, that's, that's her. And she, she is an exceptional mum and she absolutely, you know, adores our girls it goes above and beyond. I, I was say, saying to Emma the other day, I don't, I don't think that she's been away from them like for more than like one or two nights. You know, since since you know we've had you know our, our eldest and yeah. she, uh, yeah, she um, just a, a pillar of strength. You know, to to our to our family, and uh, without her. You know, the, the hole is, yeah, bigger than you could possibly imagine. Can I ask you to take us back to two weeks today, mm. um, that morning of Friday, the, the 27th of January? Yeah. Was it a normal morning like, like any other? Yeah, totally normal. Um, so the only difference that morning was, uh, you know, usually, you know, when you've got children, getting up on a school day... Mm. You know, you probably know yourself, it's just mayhem, isn't it? Yeah, carnage, yeah. Yeah, absolute <laughs> carnage. So the only difference on that morning two weeks ago was that there wasn't a lot of rushing. I came down and a lot of stuff was, was already done. It was, um, you know, the girls were having a breakfast and everything was pretty much ready to go. I came down and Nikki went upstairs to get ready. Um, and then, you know, the routine is basically if, if Nikki's taking the girls... And Willow, um, when I hear her come down, I'll I'll get them in the car, get them strapped in, get the get Willow in the boot and all that, and uh, 
Nikki comes out, give her the keys, and, and off they go. It's a well-oiled machine normally, and sometimes yeah. you walk the dog and take the kids to school, and, and on that morning it was Nikki's job. Yeah, I don't know if it's my job. Usually the, the roles are, are reversed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, it was just nothing out of the ordinary. Everything was normal. You know, because because my my working hours because I I work for a US firm, so my hours are, are like six hours behind uh, UK time. So I don't usually start work till a bit later in the morning. So um, when Nikki takes the girls to school, I then know that I've got like an hour to myself on that morning when she takes them. So I always quite look forward to that, you know, because I, I wave them off and, yeah. and then I go in the house and I put the kettle on, make a cup of tea and I think... All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a good one because there's a ton of stuff in here. It starts off with heavy emotion. What happens to people when they get heavy emotion about anything is... It changes their cadence, their demeanor, their speed. In a lot of cases, it'll make them ramp up if they're, especially if they're like the type like um, Amber Heard. But if you remember the Chloe Smith parents in Australia, they were this way. It takes all your energy. It's like a wet blanket over you and it slows you down. And you see that in him. There's also this lip withdrawal that we usually associate with needing uh, some reassurance or uncertainty as he's asked. And this is left over from the earlier video when he was asked to imagine his life without her. I think it's a tough one. There's good use of illustrators. We say these illustrators, these punctuations, people don't typically lie by going, yes, I was Miss America when they're lying. They typically use larger illustrators and that's Vray. I think Chase or Scott usually mentioned Vray's name. He came up with that, but his eyes are moving around a lot and you people are going to jump to his eyes are going here. It means he's remembering this. The problem is he asks a very complex question. When you're trying to find out where a person goes for auditory or visual memory, you have to ask a single sensory question, not tell me about that morning because then there's a ton of stuff going on and their eyes are darting all over their head. So you can't get a really good baseline out of it. And I'm a big fan of eye movement, but it's tough here. If you'd ask him, for example, what was the last thing she said, that's single sensory, he'd go to auditory memory. You'd, pick something up. If you ask what was she wearing, you get a single sensory. The other thing that we notice is his hands are open and his fingers are separated. His thumb is up. We usually associate that with confidence, whereas a person closes their hands up. Chase, you'll talk about digital flexion. Uh, we don't see that. We see open and that up. Now, here's where being an interrogator is more important than being a body language expert on this thing, because one of the most powerful things that you learn in interrogation is to listen to what people say. There's a powerful, powerful, powerful statement in here. And a, an emotional eye accessing as he finishes the statement. I'm sure somebody's already digging into it, but he says what was different that day is there was no chaos and a lot of stuff was already done. Hmm. Hmm. That for me would raise a whole lot of questions for me and likely has raised some questions for him. We were saying earlier, if your wife disappeared, you're going to have a ton of stuff going through your head. And I think we might see some of that here. Why was that happening? Because he made a point of saying a lot of stuff was already done. I would dig in. I'd say, what do you mean a lot of stuff was done? Why do you think that happened? What exactly? I'd dig in and get a lot of details. And this is a good opportunity for us to get a good baseline on him because he's talking about routines, about strapping in somebody and everything. So anytime he's giving us facts, we're going to look for that. What I want you to know, though, is just because he may have some emotion around stuff was done that morning doesn't mean it has any significance if you're one of the Internet folks trying to figure out this case. The other thing is we a lot of times will associate facial touching with stress, but he touches his face when he's talking about the U.S. firm he works for. Not sure that's the case. It may be in his baseline. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So look, unless you are a career criminal, when you commit a crime, patterns change radically. Unless you're a career c criminal and then you wake up in the morning and you commit a crime and, you know, that's your that's your general day. You go to prison, you do some time, you come out again, you commit more crime, go to prison. That's a career criminal. Okay. So we're on to domestic patterns here, which is a good place to go and it's a natural lead up to where the event happened and other than this pattern change of like stuff was ready to which i you know i'd want to know so what happened the night before what happened earlier in that day how come stuff is ready you know or, or maybe that's part of a larger pattern maybe on on that particular day stuff is more ready than other than other days of the week could be 
could be a pattern that he hasn't noticed before. I, I, I just don't know. But here's what I would, I would expect if a crime has been committed by this person, they're going to hide the pattern changes. So you'll get things like hiding time. You'll get glossing over things. You'll get, um, you will get these moments of trying to work out how you hide these things and where you hide them. What I'm getting is great illustrators that complete. So, so movements that complete and are not jagged in movement. They're fluid. I'm seeing a good, uh, tempo and, and a, and a repetitive, nice repetitive, constant tempo as he goes along, often what Scott will call kind of loping along. Great tempo on that. Um, I'm seeing uh, this is uh, above and beyond that, but good rapport between him and the interviewer. Uh, interviewer says, you know, he says, well, you know, it's, it's, it's mayhem when this happens. And the interview goes, it's carnage. He goes, yeah, utter carnage. So great kind of builds there. So good, seems a good interview so far, building rapport. What you might be uh, hitting on there is this, this shaking head that goes on. And many people will go, well, shaking head. Well, that means he's saying no to everything that's going on here. Okay. But let me put this, let me put this in your mind because heads shake for many reasons. Okay. And I won't say why I think his head shaking, but one of the reasons a head shakes is disbelief. When you disbelieve how life has gone, your head shakes. What if, I'm not saying it is, but what if this is the head shake of utter disbelief at how this day started, and then how it ended? What does that do? If you just take on that, I'm not saying you need to keep that idea, but just now take on that idea, go back and watch again and see whether you've got a different idea about who this person is and what they may or may not be part of. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right. If I was going to, if I was going to sit you down, the person watching this, and say, listen, I'm going to show you how we approach this when, or, or how I personally approach it when I go in to find out if someone is being honest or not about what they're being questioned about, be it taking money, be it hurt somebody, be it maybe somebody's missing, whatever the situation is, here's the, the steps I would take you through from step one, the very beginning. If you knew nothing about it, say, come here, man, this guy's going to teach you some stuff. This is how I'd sit you down and where I would begin. When a situation like this comes up, the first thing you want to do is you're going to look for things that don't belong and you do that and by the things that don't belong we're talking about behaviors cues that you'll see little movements and things that don't belong in this situation for example what you want to do is get a baseline you hear greg talk about that all the time you hear all of us talk about it all the time because it's so important and what a baseline is is where you sit there and you talk to that person for 10 sometimes 15 or 20 minutes and you just pretend like you're writing something oops like you're writing something down as they're talking you you know ask them some questions you're doing something else or you act like you're waiting on somebody else to come in and give you something and that gives you time to sit around just kind of shoot the shoot with them and, and and sort of get to know them so you see the way they act when they're not under stress so you're getting that baseline there now Right out of the gate, don't be comparing this person to someone you've seen in another video where they've been for sure they're guilty. Like we're seeing that. Who's the uh, Chris Watts? A lot of people are saying that's a lot of Chris Watts going on here. Right. Don't do that. Don't compare these people to each other. You can start comparing the things you see um, behavior behaviorally with that, but not at the top because you have to get a baseline first as you're going through. If you see things at the beginning that you understand to be cues of deception, don't stop and focus on those. Don't stop saying, oh, I see it. I saw one. So I know what that means. No, because those were those are going to come in groups. So you want to wait. You want to wait. And it may mean nothing. And he may have just accidentally done that. You know, his shoulder go up or he may do something with his mouth or he may show disdain or disgust or whatever. Don't focus on that. Take in all the information you possibly can. Wait. Be patient because you're going to have a lot of time to talk to him. You're not going to be able to tell by one answer, by asking them one question. You're not going to be able to tell squat from that. You're just going to be able to start getting your baseline at that point. For example, when we see his head, like Mark was saying, when we see his head shake, no. For me, those are confirmation shakes. You'll see a confirmation shake, no. I would never do anything like that, or I would never do anything like that. Even though they're saying yes, their head is nodding yes, they're confirming what they're saying. It's a confirm. I always call it a confirmation nod or a confirmation shake. Those ways I go, but you make a great point, Mark. It could be an utter disbelief. I can't believe I can't believe that happened. And that's when you see the shrugs come with them. 
like I think Chase was saying earlier, we've seen some uh, single shoulder shrugs. And those are lasting as long as they should last. They're not if they if they pop up real quick and go away, then you might have something to to start questioning. But if one goes up and stays for about a second, second and a half, sometimes a little shorter than that, a little half, maybe a half second, then take that in consideration. And as you build that baseline, remember that because you may see it later. So that's what I'll do. Is this is the first few steps. If I was first going to start sitting you down and say, okay, we're going to start from nothing. And here's how you would do that. It's not in a nutshell, but it's as simple as I can possibly make it. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, y'all, y'all covered a lot. Let me just walk through a couple things. The behavioral patterns are continuing from the first video that we took a look at. He's comfortable using her name here. And guilty people are less likely or less comfortable using a victim's name. The blink rate, which is how often we blink, is consistent throughout the video. High blink rate is more consistent with stress, and lower blink rate is kind of a focus, potentially feeling threatened or potentially feeling very relaxed. Those can both indicate a low blink rate. So there's a gestural tendency for his illustrations is to his right side. Everything is off to his right side. That may come into play here in a few minutes. But this lets me know to look for deviations to this. Every single thing that he's gesturing off to is to his right side over and over again. Let's see if there's a deviation from that in a minute. There's some facial touching here a couple of times, which if you go read a a bad body language article online, you're going to say, oh, this means somebody's lying to you and somebody will maybe pick up on that. But this facial touching is matched with respiratory inhibition or respiratory markers as well so there's breathing stopping during this so maybe like a sneeze coming on or some kind of a sinus issue so there's less likely to be a psychological origin more likely to be a physiological origin here because there's a respiratory factor there associated with that and that comes from about 17 different peer-reviewed research right here in the old handbook of nonverbal communication the american psychological association not a sponsor of today's video. That's all I got. Good job, because nobody could afford that book. It's too expensive. I think it was, I think it was 275 <laughs> No. Um, <laughs> dude. Tell me, this is the one to get. I, just, I I'm bought so it. Exci- I know I talked about it earlier. I'm so excited about this because it took me forever to find under $1,000. Wow. I bought this well, as that's... a prop. I have the PDF of it, but I bought this <laughs> yeah. just to do this on videos and stuff. Oh, wow. Very expensive prop. Let me make sure I take all that out. The eyewitness is you. Can I ask you to take us back to two weeks today, Mm. um, that morning of Friday, the the 27th of January? Was it a normal morning like like any other? Yeah, totally normal. Um, So the only difference that morning was, uh, you know, usually, you know, when you've got children, getting up on a school day, Mm. you know, you probably know yourself is just, Mayhem, isn't it? Yeah, carnage, yeah. Yeah, absolute <laughs> carnage. So the only difference on that morning two weeks ago was that there wasn't a lot of rushing. I came down and a lot of stuff was, was already done. It was, um, you know, the girls were having a breakfast and everything was pretty much ready to go. I came down and Nikki went upstairs to get ready. Um, and then, you know, the routine is basically if, if Nikki's taking the girls and Willow... Um, when I hear her come down, I'll I'll get them in the car, get them strapped in, get the get Willow in the boot and all that. And uh, Nikki comes out, give her the keys, and, and off they go. It's a well-oiled machine normally. And sometimes yeah. you walk the dog and take the kids to school. And, and on that morning, it was Nikki's job. Yeah, and then if it's my job, usually the the roles are are reversed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, again, it was just nothing out of the ordinary. Everything was normal. You know. Uh, because uh, my, my working hours, because I, I work for a US firm, so my hours are, are like six hours behind uh, UK time. So I don't usually start work till a bit later in the morning. So um, when Nikki takes the girls to school, I then know that I've got like an hour to myself on that morning when she takes them. So I always quite look forward to that, you know, because I, I wave them off and, yeah. and then I go in the house and I put the kettle on, make a cup of tea and I think... <laughs> hour bit, bit to, of peace. So at what point are you thinking something's not right here? At, wh- wh- when did it feel, where's Nikki? What, 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 at what point did that kick in? 
So she's usually back like quarter to ten average, ten o'clock, uh, you know, mm. at a push. So I'd, I'd gone up into the office at ten, thinking that she'd be back in a minute. Um, so I logged on, I was just going through some emails and stuff, you know, setting my day up, mm. and it got to, say, quarter past ten, and that's when I thought, you know, she's later than usual, but I still wasn't, like, particularly would, because she has come back at quarter past twenty past ten sometimes. Like, she might just get talk, might talking to Emma yeah. or, or another mum. a friend mom. on a dog walk, yeah. Yeah, yeah, or anybody. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not often... But she has she has got back at about quarter past ten, twenty past ten. So again, I wasn't like massively concerned or anything. Um, then it got to half past ten, and that's when I thought, you know, she's, you know, quite quite late now, more late than usual. So I tried ringing her phone, and there was no answer. I tried ringing her on WhatsApp, and again there was no answer. I tried the mobile again. And no answer, so I couldn't get it. I started to get a bit, a bit panicky. I think so. That's when I thought, right, I'm going to have to go down there and see if she's all right. You know, see if if I can see the car or, or you know see what's going on. But I still expected that I'd just get there and just oh there she is. You know, and so um, <clears throat> I go to the gym on a Friday, Friday lunchtime. So I quickly got my gym stuff on. Because I just thought, basically, I'm going to go out, find her, come home, do a bit of work. Carry on, yeah. Yeah, lunchtime, go to the gym. All right, Chase, what do you got? Uh, there's a respiratory rate increase right at the beginning of this clip, which means he's breathing faster. And this is typically associated with stress. Keep in mind that we're talking about stress and deception are different things. And we'll, when we see deception, we'll, we'll say there's a likelihood of deception here. But he's comfortable. One thing that I really want to, A, teach you about, and B, comment on on this case here, and I will humbly throw myself into the category of an armchair detective. I have no more uh, education than the police do on this case or the forensics of this case. But one thing that I think is important for you to just take outside of this, outside the case, he's comfortable changing words and editing his language as he speaks. This happens when somebody wants to say something differently mid-sentence, then they go back to change it mid-sentence. This is something you're not going to see very often in guilty people. And in the thousands of hours that I've spent doing this and analyzing behavior, this is one behavior that you'll hardly ever see in someone that's involved with a crime. They've got a story that's rehearsed. You're not going to see a lot of going back and editing because they're afraid that it appears deceptive. But if someone is not worried about being perceived as deceptive like this, you'll see more editing like this. So the emotional eye accessing, which is down into his right, is continuing here with his eyes. It's normal, and on the precise moments of emotional memory here in this clip, the gestures and behaviors are still on baseline. Scott? Yeah, I agree. <clears throat> now, we've come to a part where he has to get detailed about what happened or, or what he understands to have happened. And all the things we're seeing here are part of his baseline. So let's talk about some things that are part of his baseline, some of the things we, we continue to see. He keeps rubbing his leg. That's fine. He's just getting rid of some of that built-up stress and tension. We saw it earlier. That's okay. He's done it the whole time. And he, he's continually breaking eye contact with this guy. And that's fine, too. Because most people are under the impression when you're um, lying to somebody, you break eye contact. No, that's that's not true. We know there are studies that show that prove that's not true. Uh, many studies that, sh that show that's not true. And it goes back a couple of 3,000 years to show that most people think that, but it isn't true. Reason being, if I'm going to lie to you, my brain's going to keep want to keep watching you. So if you start making faces like this or looking, in, you know, like I don't believe you, then I'm going to want to add something to that. And those things we add, are, we, we refer to them as qualifiers. So keep that in mind as we go along. Then, um, we, again, we see plenty of head shakes and head nods. Again, those are, are I refer to them as, as confirmation nods and confirmation shakes. And those are fine because, like Mark said earlier, it's, it could be disbelief. But when you're doing that, yes, I am. And they're, you're almost illustrating with your head on those when they're, they're head shakes, yes. Th those are confirmation nods. If you say a subtle 
thing like this small as someone's doing, I would think about that being, I would look at that more as a saying yes or an agreement to what's happening, whether they realize they're doing it or not. If it's very subtle, Paul Ekman goes into a whole thing about that. I know we talk about Paul Ekman and Joan Navarro and all kinds of people on here. Look these people up and just get one of their books and you'll it'll you know change the way you see all of these things and you'll see them clearer like like we do as we go through this. Um well, all of a sudden we see is is illustrators disappeared, which is a little bit odd from that. And that just lets us know that there's an issue there because he's focusing even tighter on what he's talking about. In this section, in this part of it, it doesn't mean he's lying. It doesn't mean he's being deceptive, but he's really focused on what he's doing, but not from a deceptive point of view. And we, and we would assume that from what all we've seen so far and from the questions he's asking him. That's why he's zeroing in on what's happening. So you got to think about, do all these behaviors we've seen so far, do they all go together? Is there anything that doesn't fit in there so far? Anything goofy or weird out of nowhere that we haven't seen? Because we've seen uh, three videos up to this point. Is there anything in there we see that's new? That's not, that hasn't happened yet. That seems odd or gives you that odd feeling on the inside. Anything that stands out from the other things we've seen, anything that makes you feel odd is something to pay attention to. Going back to the part where if I was sitting you down, showing you how to, how we approach this or, or the beginner's approach to start learning about this, that's how you do it. Feeling is very important. So is there anything that makes you feel odd about that? Um, not the, uh, not, I won't get it. I'm, I'm getting ready to go off on my brain tangent. So I'll do that too often. So I won't do that. So, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So to kind of move further into what you're saying there, Chase, also he's able to describe the emotional journey that he's on. And what we'll see later on is that he is perfectly happy to correct somebody on that emotional journey as well. Now, to be able to map out emotional journey and say, look, here's how I felt at this point, and then things changed, and then I felt this, and then things moved forward, and I felt this, you really have to have lived through the situation, or you've got to be like a really good writer and be able to have worked out, oh, you know, I'd be feeling this at this, and I'd be feeling this, and here's the name of the feeling as well. Okay, and here's the rhythm of it as well. So I'm going to reproduce the rhythm and name the feeling. Well, he's doing this in a very fluid manner, which means he's most likely not making it up. He's most likely lived through this. And to your point, Chase, he's going to correct you on it if you get it in the wrong order. Somebody's had to make this up. If you start to create a narrative that's okay, you'll just you'll just join in on that. It's like, yeah, whatever you say, I'll go with whatever motion you have because you're doing the work for me. He's already had these feelings. He's very happy about not hiding time, giving you very good quality of of in a linear fashion how these times play out, the emotional journey. Uh, it, we see he moves from not concerned to concerned and even uses the word a bit panicky. Okay. So again, we'll see where this, where this comes in our next video, but this is not the behavior I would expect to see from anybody who's being deceptive or trying to hide something in there. I mean, he's even open about the idea of, Hey, I stopped to put my gym kit on because I thought it's going to be okay. And I'll just, you know, I'll just move on. To that extent, there is a little bit of of positivity there that things are genuinely going to be okay. It's an anomaly. It's going to be all right. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so I really like this one because you're right. He edits as he speaks. I have a dear friend named John who has never finished a story in the entire 40 years I've known him. And he'll say, let me finish my story. I'd say I've been waiting for 20 years. He will edit as he speaks. And only when he is speaking that way, if you don't know him, you may think, okay, he's making this up. But when a person is making something up, there's very different body languages. They're trying to figure out what to say next. This is another one of those things that we look for is that down left eye accessing. If you sit for a few minutes and start to think about how would you describe this situation, you'll find your eyes drifting kind of down into your left. And so when we expect this, we expect when a person is halting to go into some kind of internal dialogue. We don't see it. What we see with this guy is as long as he is regurgitating facts and precise things about timelines and that, it's smooth. And it's it's 
easy. When you start to get into something more complex, like feelings and that, then he does edit as he speaks and he talks about those things. People who work in precise ways often are that way. My buddy, John is a IT guy, a coder for mainframes or that kind of stuff. And so I looked him up, this guy's an engineer, not surprised that he would be more comfortable in one thing than the other. The other thing that I like about this video is you could not ask for better illustration. We said illustrations when I'm using my body to punctuate my thoughts than he does in this entire story. In the beginning, he's making that point and asking for approval as he's talking about her. His face kind of scrunches up. He uses his face. My dad would do something similar when he would ask you a question. Do you understand what I'm saying? He shows negative emotion and he is then showing a different ex expression when he scrunches his face in this way, everything down in that, for that brow down as he's showing that there's concern and negative emotion. And when he says the, uh, if she is all right, you see his brow knit followed by confusion where there's narrow, there's that, that um, narrowing of the eyes, furrowed brow and brow down and furrowed, which is difficult to do. And he's blinking and his lips are pushed up. All of that stuff showing confusion, showing concern, showing negative emotion, all that fits the story to a T. So it's, Concern, followed by hope, followed by confusion, followed by emotional accessing at the end. Really good. If this guy is hiding something, that's powerful, really good body language. And one of us would have a hard time doing it, in my opinion. The eyewitness is you. Bit, right. bit of peace. So at what point are you thinking something's not right here? At w w when did it feel, where's Nikki? What, 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 at what point did that kick in? So she's usually back like quarter to ten average, ten o'clock, uh, you know, mm. at a push. So I'd, I'd gone up into the office at ten, thinking that she'd be back in a minute. Um, so I logged on, I was just going through some emails and stuff, you know, setting my day up, mm. and it got to, say, quarter past ten, and that's when I thought, you know, she's later than usual, but I still wasn't, like, particularly would, because she has come back at quarter past 20 past 10 sometimes like you, you might just get talking about talking to emma yeah. or, or another friend mom. on a dog walk yeah 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 or anybody so you know it's, it, it's, it's not often but she has she has got back at about quarter past 10 20 past 10 so again i wasn't like massively concerned or anything um then it got to half past 10 and that's when i thought you know she's you know quite quite late now more late than usual so I tried ringing her phone, and there was no answer. I tried ringing her on WhatsApp, and again, there was no answer. So I tried the mobile again, and no answer. So I couldn't get it. I started to get a bit a bit panicky, I think. So that's when I thought, right, I'm going to have to go down there and see if she's all right, you know, see if, if I can see the car or, or, you know, see what's going on. But I still expected that i'd just get there and just oh there she is you know and so um <clears throat> i go to the gym on a friday friday lunchtime so i quickly got my gym stuff on because i just thought basically i'm going to go out find her come home do a bit of work carry on yeah yeah lunchtime go to the gym <laughs> we're going to leave and then the phone rang mm. and it was um it was the school and it was the receptionist at school and she said Mr. Ansel, it's a bit of a weird one. Okay, hello. So it's a bit, it's a bit of a weird one, but we found um, Willow and Nicola's Nicky's phone on on the bench and the harness halfway down the embankment on the floor. So because I was, you're wor you're already worried at this point. Yeah, because yeah. I'm I'm just about to leave, so right. I've got my gym stuff on. I'm about to leave thinking I'm going to see her, mm. you know, pass her, get there and find her. Then I get that call. And in, in an instant, it's like your whole... Of course. Because you... I knew straight away that it wasn't normal. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, because I said, well, where is she? And I'm like, well, they can't find her. So I also know that she would never in a million years leave Willow. Like, Willow is like our third child. Mm. So I know, like, she'd never... Like, the fact that Willow's just in the field on her own, off the lead, obviously extremely concerning. Mm. So 
obviously I'll, you know, just in a mad panic then, you know, because it's... I got hit by that weird... It's like, it's like your world just drops out because you know something's weird has happened. Um, so I got in the car, drove down there, ran down the river to where the bench is. Somebody had Willow, and obviously there was a few other dog walkers there and stuff like that. Mm. Handed me Willow, handed me Nicky's phone. I still expected, obviously, to just have a, a look around and well, there she is, or, or there she is. So, you know, we're all looking. I'm, I'm like walking off into the field that way, like looking around the corners, looking over the hedge, looking over the stile, and, you nothing. know, nothing, nothing. But I'd rung 999 on the way because I obviously knew something that was, was, was wrong. So the police rang me then while I was at the bench and said, look, you've, you've got to get home because um, the police are going to be coming to your house. We need somebody at your house. You get home, the police are on the way there. All right. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is a really good one, too. Let me give you two lines to go back and listen to and pay close attention and listen to the stress in this guy's voice that doesn't show up easily. This is because it's out of character. The dog was on her own and off the leash. There's a lot of emphasis in those two sentences. And I think what we're seeing is that's him now it's real because this is a big deal. This is out of character for her. Something has happened. And watch his body language as he's doing it again, punctuating as he goes. Eyes down right at the beginning with emotion. When he said, she said, he's talking about the, the person from the school. His head drives down to your point, Scott, that confirming driving. And then he turns his head and somebody's going to say, oh, he's avoiding the question. No, he's looking at the dog to get the dog to come over to him. Then he restates his story in the middle of that interruption. He backs up and comes back with the same story. It was a bit of a weird one, he says. He adapts at his face again. And look, there's a million reasons we adapt. We touch, we do whatever. And that can be retelling a stressful story. Lying can be stressful. Defending a, our position can be stressful. If we're being attacked by someone at work, I often say we are primitive creatures in our in our limbic brains. They don't know the difference between being attacked by our spouse and attacked by a tiger. They respond the same way and they can be very aggressive at times. If you want to know now whether that leg thing is an adapter from lying or whether it is something he does all the time, really easy to tell. Because if he were lying and that was his stress relief, he would be rubbing the hell out of this dog because he has his hand on the dog now and not his leg. But he doesn't. He pets the dog and contains the dog. And then when he starts to feel that need to do what he always does, he reaches back across and pets the dog on the neck once. But he's not just petting this dog to death and going crazy. Um, there's lots of studies that show that re that petting or that petting those dogs or stroking dogs will relieve stress, and he isn't doing it. So it's not a stress adapter for him. It's just a habit, I think, at this point. He's back to editing when he speaks, and I love these two pieces. He's wide-eyed at weird and short nods to illustrate his point. And then he's wide-eyed from residual shock, clearly. Once you live something, it stays with you at she handed me Nikki's phone. Then he goes back to normal for the dog. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right, things are beginning to change just a little bit here from what we've been seeing so far. Greg's gone over some of them. The number of illustrators we're seeing, that number's gone up. So they're being a little more dramatic and, and in fact, so why would that be? Because his stress level is going up a little bit because he's talking, he's reliving this experience. He's talking you through what happened. So his stress level starts to go up and his behaviors become amplified. The normal baseline behaviors, we're still, we're still seeing those. They're just amplified, just getting a little bit more intense. His cadence speeds up. He gets a little bit louder when he talks. His tones get a little, a little stronger. His head movements increase. He scratches his beard to get rid of some of that built up stress and, and tension. And that's normal. This is all normal for a situation like this. So it's, it's okay. A lot of people are going to see all this and go, ah, so much is going on. There is a lot going on. But remember what we talked about at the beginning. As we walk through this, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to, to show you how to approach this from the beginning, from step one. And so don't look at these things. Remember I said earlier, when they pop out like that, don't just focus on them, something like that, because we're seeing everything happen at once. It's almost blooming or blossoming into something as he tells the story. So you've got to pay attention to what he's seeing or what he's saying uh, and compare that to what you're seeing. Are these things happening because of something he's saying? Yes. What is he talking about? He's talking about what happened. He's getting specific about what he did and, and, the, and the situation. 
Then as it goes along, his volume gets a little bit lower. He's not subconsciously trying to um, make this inter- this interviewer believe him. He's not like calming down to go, you know, so that he's not doing that. He's not trying to get him to to believe him. We don't see that in here at all, not even a little bit. He's just telling him what happened. Um, so some are going to see this, uh, some of these signs of, be, of deceptive behavior, but that's not what it is. Uh, just an increase in non-deceptive behaviors, just an amplification of what we've seen so far due to the stress he's he's starting to feel from explaining what's happened. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, and I think the rhythm is changing now and and his volume is changing now, not only because of the stress you're talking about there, Scott, but the extra stress of having to name the emotion that he's going through and he hasn't got a decent name for it. This is the moment where he he corrects and, and says, look, here's, here's the transition of emotions and here's at which point I felt, you know, a, a little bit concerned here. And then more news comes and then he says, and, and the world... Um, drops away or some some metaphor a little bit like that and it's very hard for him to find decent words for that he grasps that 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 metaphor which is you know very unliteral i mean it's it's a it's a metaphor of course the world didn't literally drop away but what else what other words have you got for that think about it for yourself if somebody that you love goes missing what are you feeling right now what are you feeling well you know there's a hole there and you don't have a feeling for it because hopefully the people you love most don't go missing every day so you don't have the vocabulary you don't have the emotional vocabulary and when you do have those emotions you don't have the words to fit them that's another thing that he's grappling with right now is exactly what is this feeling called and i I want you to watch that again and see him his rhythm change his tone change because he hasn't got the exact words for that yeah the world drops out uh greg what do you got on this one oh chase what do you got on this one so I think the behavior here is all still within baseline. His speech is unhurried. And just as a as a point to notice, when somebody's fabricating parts of the story and not the whole story, so they're fabricating pieces of the story, you'll hear the fabricated parts of the story speed up a little bit faster than the other parts. And this happens, I think, because of an unconscious desire to minimize the time it takes for the stressful part and to return to the known and the comfortable part of the story as soon as possible. We're not seeing that here at all. So when somebody is mixing or braiding together truth and fiction, you'll see the fiction be just slightly faster. So his gestures, his cadence, his his tone, his pitch, his eye contact, all within his baseline with a normal behavior we'd expect to see. You see genuine expressions appear on his face the moment he's feeling the emotion that he's speaking about, not the moment that he wants you to realize how he was feeling. This is a very common mistake people who are guilty make all the time. They show the facial expressions at the moment they think, you realize something that they're feeling instead of when they felt it during the story that they're telling. This is totally honest behavior here. One thing we talk about every once in a while, Mark, you've you've spoken about this as well before, is this I, you shift of pronouns. And one of them is I'm, I'm switching to the word you to describe certain things. In guilty people, we hear the word you being shifted to thought processes, reasons, motives and behaviors, why I did certain things. You hear it in Prince Harry. You're going to hear it in a lot of the videos that we do, uh, especially when those people were found to be guilty. Here, the IU shift is about emotion. That's the only time you hear him shift into you. Saying you is conveying that emotion and helping you to understand how that feels. Big difference. The eyewitness is you. We're going to leave. And then the phone rang, and it was um, it was the school, and it was the receptionist at school, and she said, "Mr. Ansel, it's a bit of a weird one." Okay, well, uh, so it's a bit it's a bit of a weird one, but we found um, Willow and Nicola's Nicky's phone on on the bench, and the harness halfway down the embankment on the floor. 
So, because I was... You're, wearing, you're already worried at this point. Yeah, because yeah. I'm, I'm just about to leave. So right. I've got my gym stuff on. I'm about to leave thinking that I'm going to see her, mm. you know, pass her, get there and find her. Then I get that call. And in, in an instant, it's like your whole... Of course. Because you... I knew straight away that it wasn't normal. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, because I said, well, where is she? And like, well, they can't find her. So I also know that she would never in a million years leave Willow. Like, Willow is like our third child. Mm. So I know, like, she'd never... Like, the fact that Willow's just in the field on her own, off the lead, obviously extremely concerning. Mm. So, obviously, I'll, you know, I'm just in a mad panic then, you know, because it's... I got hit by that weird... It's like, it's like your world just drops out because you know something's weird has happened. Um, so I got in the car, drove down there, ran down the river to where the bench is. Somebody had Willow, and obviously there was a few other dog walkers there and stuff like that. Mm. Handed me Willow, handed me Nicky's phone. I still expected, obviously, to just have a, a look around and, well, there she is, or, or there she is. So... You know, we're all looking. I'm, I'm like walking off into the field that way, like looking around the corners, looking over the hedge, looking over the stile, and you nothing. know, nothing, nothing. But I'd rung nine 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 on the way because I obviously knew something mm. was 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 wrong. So the police rang me then while I was at the bench and said, "Look, you you've got to get home because um, the police are going to be coming to your house. We need somebody at your house. You get home. The police are on the way there." What do you think might have happened? We, we've always tried to keep all options open because we don't want to shut down any avenue. You know, we've always been very careful that we don't want to say, oh, we think it's that, and then push that when it might not be. Mm. Um, the most obvious thing, of course, has always been the river. Um, it's always been my gut instinct and, 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 and her sisters and, and family that um, that isn't the case. Mm. Extensive um, searching, you know, is probably well aware of gone, has gone on in that river. I mean, they were in there, you know, I mean, I, I have to categorically say I cannot fault the police in any of this. They, they have been incredible. And the relationship that that we have working on this is still is very very strong. It's very good. Um, so th this isn't any uh, criticism of them at all. I just want to make that I want to make that clear. Uh, but the fact that they were in the divers and underwater rescue team and 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 all that were in that river on that on the day, and um, thankfully found absolutely nothing. Um, in the part where you would, I guess, have to presume mm. is her last lo known location. If you, if you take all those things into account, uh, the unlikeliness mm. of it, you know, you would have to sort of say that really the she, the river isn't isn't what happened, and so we always felt that the mobile phone and the harness. And everything it could it could possibly be a decoy. Um, again, I'm, we don't have evidence. No, but these we, are things that you yeah. naturally would think about because you know the, the team's call was still active yeah. at the time, wasn't it? And the Willow's harness is on the on the floor, and you know, I'm, I'm sure these are things that constantly you're thinking about. Yeah, yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. I mean, like the only thing we're bothered about is finding her. Like there's. Mm -hmm. Nothing else matters. That's the only thing that we're bothered about. It's just finding her. So, you know, it's um, of course you're going to be thinking this, mm. these these things. And so, the more searching of the river that went on, the more confident we were that it wasn't the river. Mm. You know, especially things like, again, you know, it's not nice talking about it, but at the same time, we've taken hope from it, the fact that um, no item of clothing or anything has been found anywhere where 
you would have thought something, you know, would have... Something might have been found, yeah. All right, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is an interesting one because he starts off with a mouth chew. He's looking down to his right, and he does the little mouth chew, which we associate with relieving stress. Now, let's talk about for just a minute what is the fundamental difference between what the four of us do and the armchair person who's just starting in body language and who's an absolutist. There's really no meaning. If I touch my face, it means nothing. If I bite my lip, it means nothing. If I always do it, if I always do it. But if suddenly I do it, it means something. So absolutist assign meanings to every one of these little things rather than looking at a holistic message that strings all this stuff together. So there's so many, only so many movements a human can make and how they go together is part of that part of that messaging, just like a language. When you speak words, there's only so many ways you can put them together. But body language is words. When we're looking at behaviors and body language, we're looking at what you're saying, plus we're looking at pitch, tone, and cadence in the way you speak, Plus, we're looking at all these pieces of body language you're talking about. And what we're trying to find, every one of us, is a congruent message between that spoken word, that diction, pitch, tone, and cadence, body language, movement, everything that you're doing, you're, everything about you. Chase just brought up one just a minute ago where a person may rush to get through the information and in some cases may slow as they work through the information. So we're looking for the mechanics of how a person speaks. There are a couple of really interesting pieces of body language here. One that's helplessness, that straight up eye roll and intake breath. If I do that, I'm preparing to go after somebody I think is an idiot. I just am like, okay, that's a dumb answer. And I raise my brows and do that. And a lot of people will do that before they lay into something. Then he goes over here in a move we haven't seen a whole lot is he's asked, what do you think happened? And he goes over to a creative kind of a posture and then turns back and looks. Again, there are no absolutes. This for us is looking for... Where do we get information from? Then there's a, a request for approval, raises his brow just a bit, not doesn't wrinkle up at the top, just his brow. And then that's when he's trying to get, see if you get what he's talking about. He shows some distaste, closes his mouth as he talks about the sister and the family don't believe she's in the river. And when he does this disclaimer about the police, a lot of people are going to jump to, oh, he's being overly polite to the police. It must be an issue because... We just had Alex Murdoch last week who said, well, the 911 was a great operator. Well, that's a different thing. He's saying thank you is what he's saying. And then when he gets to the river, isn't what happened? His forehead goes relaxed. And everything he has said in this entire thing, I think, has been powerful to show that he is going to have a body language that's associated with the words he's using. And all those pieces are tied together. But then he touches his nose with the back of his hand. And I don't think that that is an indicator of deception, like people will tell you. It is just he's thinking about negative thoughts. Maybe that's what he's doing. Maybe he's got something wrong. But what we don't see is a lot of clusters of behavior that indicate that he is being deceptive. His messaging, verbal, nonverbal, physical, cadence, pitch, tone, all appear to support each other. Uh, Chase, what do you got? So I've only got one thing here only. When he gets to this point of illustrating how they've exhausted uh, the river as being a possibility, uh, his level of comfort, actual comfort, with saying the word decoy, this gives me tremendous relief that two things are very likely. Number one, there might be a chance that these babies are going to have their mom back, uh, most importantly. And number two, there's almost no chance that he was involved in any way. Just based off of all the stuff that we've seen and his comfort level here with saying decoy is really important to me based on the tens of thousands of hours that uh, I've been doing this and analyzing stuff like this. That's a big one for this video. Mark? Yeah, if I was uh, wanting to see somebody lying, being deceptive, or trying to cover stuff over, I would want to see... Um, him giving reasons for his innocence and weaving that into the story and setting things up as to 
why it can't be him. I would want to see him de-risking in the story to deflect away from it. I want to see him de-conflicting elements and trying to sort out the one thing that he said and how it doesn't conflict with the next thing. I would want to see what Greg calls chaff and redirect, which is him taking us off into areas that maybe don't really matter, but are kind of shiny and interesting, and we might get a little bit more obsessed with. I would have liked to have seen that early on, you know, in this domestic stuff, I would have liked to see lots of chaff and redirect around there because, because, you know, the story of the crime would have started way, way earlier on and it, it would be showing up in there and he'd, he'd need to be de-risking that and, and redirecting us. Um, I'd want to see from him some good resume statements, you know, like, well, you know, in the Royal Navy, I'd like to see him going, well, you know, because, you know, as, a, as an engineer, um, you know, and giving us reason to go, oh, well, this guy's an engineer. So, you know, don't look, don't look in that direction. You know, he's got this all sorted out. It's none of that, none of that at all. Um, what I am seeing is still a good baseline of these good illustrators going on, still going pretty well as he's getting into some trickier territory. His illustrators are still good for me. Um, his self soothing baseline is, is still there as well at a good level even as he's getting into this trickier stuff it, it looks it looks very very good you know i wish i could help people out there so far with something to uh to you know if, you, if you're always looking for perpetrators i wish i could give you something but i got i got nothing for you today uh scott what do you got on this one all right this is interesting because he's asked what he thinks happened and we don't seem rushed to any. This is exactly what happened. It was this person, I think, because uh, of this, that he doesn't get right into that. You know, like quite often we'll see that with with other cases we've covered when they'll they'll just get right into it. They'll go say this is what happened. He doesn't do that. He does say what he thinks happened, but he doesn't jump right into it. And, and, and with this hurried fervor to say what what he thinks happened. He's thinking about his answer because he doesn't have a loaded one. So he's thinking about what he's saying. And by loaded, I don't mean, I mean, he's had one that he's rehearsed and gotten ready and, and prepared. Like we've seen quite often when someone has an answer ready, they just start spewing that thing out. But he'll stop and he'll think. And like Greg always talks about, he'll edit what he's getting ready to say. So this lets us know that that he, that so far, everything is okay. Everything is as it should be. So what we, what we want to see is a non-aggressive, organic, calm answer or reply or, or statement. And that's what we're seeing here. But what we're seeing here is an organic, non-aggressive, calm uh, answer because he's just flowing, he's loping, he's flop, this, loping right along and everything's going smooth. Um, this isn't completely thought out as far as, I, I think he's thought about it before, but he hasn't sat there and told exactly what he's thought about what happened before. And if he has, he's sort of watching his mouth because I think that maybe they've said, like he mentioned earlier, uh, I've got to watch what I say because we don't want to turn people off from looking over here or looking over there because of, of what I think or what I, I think the, the problem may be or, or the situation may really be. His head is it, it remains straight up. We never see him cover his neck. He never brings his head down for very long at all. So he doesn't – and we – associate that with someone feeling threatened or, or or maybe feeling a little guilty about something. They they guard their neck. Sometimes it's with their hands. Sometimes they'll bring their chin down. We don't see that. His head stays pretty much straight up. And we're not seeing all these quick little jerky movements and things. We're seeing everything is fairly smooth as it goes along. At some parts, we see some some jerky movement and things start getting ramped up. But that's that's another video. But in this in this situation, everything seems to be as as it, it should be. And his head is still tilted toward that interviewer, which, which lets us know he's not trying to distance himself from it. Sometimes they'll be tilted and they'll be leaned back, but he's just tilted and sort of leaned toward him. So he doesn't have a problem with the guy. There's still no barriers being stuck and being thrown up. And of course, we talk about barriers being anything from a pen to an arm to a cup, trying to get distance from him, trying to put anything between he and himself and the uh, interviewer. So everything's looking okay so far. Um Everything is, is is as it should be, as far as I'm concerned, as, as far as so far as it looks to me. So if you're looking at something like in in this video, and again, if you're if you were just the beginning, I was sitting down and going, here's how you do this. Nothing sticks out. Nothing looks weird. Nothing looks out of place. Nothing looks or sounds 
um, like it shouldn't look or sound. Everything is going really well at this point. What do you think might have happened? We, we've always tried to keep all options open because we don't want to shut down any avenue. We have, we've always been very careful that we don't want to say, oh, we think it's that, and then push that when it might not be. Mm. Um, the most obvious thing, of course, has always been the river. Um, it's always been my gut instinct and, 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 and her sister's... And, and family that um, that isn't the case. Mm. Extensive um, searching, you know, is probably well aware of gone has gone on in that river. I mean, they, they were in there, you know. I mean, I, I have to categorically say I cannot fault the police in any of this. They, they have been incredible, and the relationship that that we have working on this is still is very very strong. It's very good. Um, so that this isn't any. Uh, criticism of them at all. I just want to make that. I want to make that clear. Uh, but the fact that they were in the divers and underwater rescue team and 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 all that were in that river on that on the day, and um, thankfully found absolutely nothing um, in the part where you would, I guess, have to presume is her last lo- known location. If you if you take all those things into account, uh, the unlikeliness mm. of it, you know, you would have to sort of say that really the the, the river isn't isn't what happened, and so we always felt that the mobile phone and the harness and everything it could it could possibly be a decoy. Um, again, I'm not, we don't have evidence. No, but these we, are things that you yeah. naturally would think about because, you know, the, the team's call was still active yeah. at the time, wasn't it? And the Willow's harness is on the, on the floor and, you know, I'm, I'm sure these are things that constantly you're thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. I mean, like, the only thing we're bothered about is finding her. Like, there's mm. nothing else matters. That's the only thing that we're bothered about is just finding her. So, you know, it's... Um, of course you're going to be thinking this, mm. these these things. And so the more searching of the river that went on, the more confident we were that it wasn't the river. Mm. You know, especially things like, again, you know, it's not nice talking about it, but at the same time we've taken hope from it, the fact that um, no item of clothing or anything has been found anywhere where you would have thought something, you know, would have... Something might have been found, yeah. And I suppose the question after that is, what then? And uh, well, this... and the difficulty is you allowing your mind to think where she might be and what's happened to her, which is, is horrible as well, I imagine. Yeah, it's, it, it's horrendous because it's, it's, people don't just vanish into thin air. It's absolutely impossible. So something has happened. Something has happened. Find out what it is. Find out what it is. There has to be a way to find out what happened. There has to be. You cannot, you cannot walk your dog down a river and just vanish into thin air. Something, is, something happened that day. Something. Find out. Find out what it is. And, and my, my plea now is personally, I want every house, every garage, every outbuilding, the land scrutinised. I want it all searched. I want it all scrutinised. Every piece of it. And I'm, very, I'm not going to... You're not going to appease me with anything else. That, that is what I want to happen. Because for something to have happened there... It's, it's not many. You you would only know that area by local people. It's a local area. I, I, we walked down there for years, and I mean years. You see the same faces every single day, and on the very odd occasion when you see somebody that you know you you don't know, they st- they stand out like a sore thumb. Okay, Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, so this is a change for me. This is the first kind of big and more radical change that we've seen, and I think it's important. Uh, his gestures are now emphatic and repetitious. It's aggressive and suppressive in the gestures that he's using. There's a lot of repetition in the words here. Something has to happen. The word something is repeated again and again with these um, uh, suppressive, more aggressive gestures. Find out, find out is repeated again and again. There has to be a way. And on that word way, I believe we get anger in the lower teeth there. Um, all, every, searched and scrutinized. So he, he's, he wants the, the ground blitzed completely. All and every. Um, so, I mean, a massive change here, way more aggression. I think this is, he's now being uh, demanding. I think demanding is, is because he is making, he's, he's trying to push forward his demand for where this investigation goes and where his mind is at the moment, where is, where something has happened. Again, it's an interesting idea because there is, there's no definition on what that something must be, but something has to have happened. Okay. And, and the idea of finding out, finding out and some real anger in that. Now, remember what, what anger is about as, as an emotion. And if you want to learn about, uh, emotions, uh, Paul Ekman has a, a brilliant book. And for me, the best book that, that he ever wrote or was transcribed really is his conversations with the Dalai Lama, where it's Ekman and the Dam Dalai Lama talking about why would emotions exist in the first place? Why in the evolution? Because Dalai Lama is not so much an evolutionist and, and Ekman is way more an evolutionist. And it's a conversation about why would we have emotions? The emotion of anger is to get stuff done fast. Get stuff done fast. When you get angry, your heart rate goes up, your breathing rate goes up, you get more energized, you get an adre adrenaline. And if you want something or you want to defend against something, anger is a great emotion to have. Put it in the wrong place at the wrong time, it can get you into a lot of trouble. But in the right place at the right time, it can get you and your body and your family and your mind exactly what you need at that point. And I think that's why we're seeing anger right now. He knows what he wants and he wants to get that right now. Chase, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I've always heard the quote that anger is always, every ounce of anger is a secret desire that something was different and a desire to change it. Yeah. Uh, which goes along with that, right. getting stuff done. And here, I think there's more honest behavior. Keep in mind, we're not experts on the case. We're not forensics experts. And we're not privy to any more information than the next person. Uh, but we are experts in humans and I, this is a human. But one thing that really stands out to me in this clip is that he just vehemently wants the search to happen. I think this is spot on honest behavior. But I keep wondering where the request is to have her back. And when is he going to want her to come home? And I'm not insinuating this implies any guilt whatsoever. It's just an unusual uh, thing to notice about the clip. And uh, all of us make YouTube videos for a living. If you haven't noticed, we're all we're all we've all been victim to saying something and like leaving something out, and wishing we could go back and throw it in there. I just think nobody's perfect. Uh, this is a, just an unusual thing to notice in this clip here, Greg. Yeah, I'm going to cover a couple of places here, so hang in for the messages. But this is Mark. I'm on the same page you are. Emphatic message number one, and I, I summed it up by saying someone knows something, and I want the whole damn place searched. Usually, people who have done something are not going to ask for a whole lot of searches. Number one, but he's angry, and look, this guy's so contained it's hard to see anger. But those bearing those lower teeth at that declaration. He's probably not going to do that either. He's going to say, hey, something happened. And his chin is up in defiance or indignation. At find out what it is. That's powerful. That's powerful. That's throwing your throat open. And people don't typically do that. You heard, you heard Scott say, we often will protect our throat when we're doing something. Pre-confession body language is our chin drops to cover our throat. So we see a lot of anger here. Chin up. Tone and cadence and pitch are all different from before. His tone is telling. In the last element of every single piece, it, it is telling. Until that last place where he's asking for something, he lilts up. That's the only thing, and we see a narrowing of his mouth. And Chase, 
I, I paid attention to that same thing you're talking about. One last thing, body language wise, before I move to what you're talking about, Chase, his fingers and thumbs are together now as he's doing this. He's demanding something. He's less confident he's going to get it. You can see that. Chase, I'm with you. He's not saying I want her back. He's not doing that. But there's a whole a whole roll of stuff running back in his head. Look, none of us are in this situation. If you ever lost anybody, you know the flood of stuff that's going on in your head, the flood of stuff that's going on emotionally. If we were machines, we could turn all that off, but you can't. So self-doubt, did I do something? All that could be playing. And as we walk through this, I'm going to show you a couple of points why I think that we're seeing some of that playing deep in the person. There's a lot more going on in a person than is showing at the top. And it's really easy to find a reason why that person didn't do something. Scott, what do you got? All right. He's he's getting right to the point here, as everybody said so far. And he's really logical and level, level-headed about this. Now, again, going back to the person who's just beginning and just getting into this, everything it, it things are getting different again. These these um, behaviors we're seeing are amplified even more. His cadence and his voice. We, uh, cadence is how fast you speak, how many how many words you speak. Uh, let's say per minute. You know, maybe fifty, it may be a hundred, and, and he's goosing right along here at a pretty good rate. His blink rate's gone up, so that tells us something's going on in here. He's he's thinking about something. His voice and volume have changed, uh, tone wise. His vo- voice volume and tone have changed, and this is like I think it was Mark was saying. This is frustration and anger. At the same time, we're seeing this this combination a combination of things, a blend of those, as Ekman puts it. His nostrils flare. And here's the interesting part: his eyelids widen, his eyes get a little bit wide, but we see a, a bit of his bottom teeth. That's how we know, or it gives us gives us the impression that we're seeing two things at once. Because mostly, when someone gets mad, you'll see their eyes kind of squint. Some <clears throat> most people are in the impression if you're angry, your eyes squint like this. Nope, because that's fake anger. What you, what you want to see is you want to see the eyes squinted, but you want to see them open up a little bit so they look like they're crazy. That's anger because you're, they're trying to see what's going on, but the but the emotion is making their 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 eyelids squish down as they're trying to push them up, trying to get an eye on everything, make sure everything is uh, going the way it should be, or as they make their plan to do whatever it's, or it's going to happen. Uh, nothing in his story's changed. Nothing is confusing. Uh, he's not added anything new, substantially new to anything. And um, by that, I mean, there's nothing weird he's added, <clears throat> you know, out of nowhere. Sometimes they'll throw in the whole thing you've never heard before. And you go, oh, wow, this is getting good. But if you're just starting to the beginning, like I was saying earlier, these are the things we look for. This is where all those a lot of those things start happening. Sometimes they'll happen when they're calm and you can see things happen. But right here, usually you'll get big clusters of things going on, especially when they get ramped up and they're emotional. If that emotion is real, if it's true emotion. Um his story hasn't changed at all. Um, his arms and legs are still wide and he's laid back, looks relaxed. Everything looks as it should. Everything sounds the way it should sound for someone in this situation. There's nothing really odd happening, except we're seeing some new things to add to his baseline. We we, we know what is what anger looks like. It's subtle anger. He's not getting ready to haul off and punch somebody, which is a different kind of, that's a more advanced into that expression. We're seeing the subtleties of, of anger here, not full-blown expressions, not micro expressions, but not full-blown expressions here. So that's all I'll say on that stuff. Yeah, I would this is you. And I suppose the question after that is, what then? And uh, well, this and the difficulty is you allowing your mind to think where she might be and what's happened to her, which is is horrible as well, I imagine. Yeah, it's it, it's horrendous because you you. People don't just vanish into thin air. It's absolutely impossible. So something has happened. Something has happened. Find out what it is. Find out what it is. There has to be a way to find out what happened. There has to be. You cannot, you cannot walk your dog down a river and just vanish into thin air. Something, something happened that day. Something. Find out. Find out what it is. And, and my my plea now is, personally, I want every house, every garage, every outbuilding, the land scrutinised. I want it all searched. I want it all scrutinised. Every piece of it. And I'm, I'm, very, yeah, I'm not going to. You're not going to appease me with anything else. That that is what I want to happen, because. For something to have happened there, 
It's, it's not many. You you would only know that area by local people. It's a local area. I, I, we've walked down there for years, and I mean years. You see the same faces every single day, and on the very odd occasion when you see somebody that you know you you don't know, they st they stand out like a sore thumb. And I think that's an important point to make because there might be some people watching this thinking, "Why are you doing this? Why are you yeah. talking to us?" and the reason you're doing that, I don't want to put words in your mouth, is because you feel that somebody out there knows something and yeah. that's the appeal that you're trying to make. Yeah, definitely. Definitely, and I'm just pleading with, with them. Just please, anything, anything, no matter how tiny, just please, just come forward with it, please. Because that, is, that could be the key mm. to finding a... And as a family, we're not bothered about anything else. Like, there's nothing else. The only thing is we just have to find her. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, some indecision around, around this one. I think um, strength, we get an eyebrow raise on that. Could be a look for approval. Is that, is that what you, the audience, or the interviewer think I should have right now? Strength, okay? Hope, no eyebrow raise on that is that because he doesn't have hope or he doesn't need to signal is that is that what you think i should have and on a previous interview he was kind of picked up on not having hope uh, i assume that he's um he now knows that people expect him to have hope whether he has it or not there's a public expectation a social expectation to have have hope and yet no eyebrow raise on that we're going to find her eyebrow raise and a bitter taste in the mouth. So, so a look for approval potentially and negativity around this and all of this within what I would call a vehement plea. He's asking uh, for help and he's asking it with great passion and, and, and aggressive passion, a vehement plea. So I, I don't have any answers, I think, about what this, what this means, but I find it interesting that we have, we're going to find her and a look, of appro look for approval, but bitterness in, in the mouth. If I thought about this in the most negative way, I would wonder if at an unconscious level, he truly feels that that will happen. What an awful situation to, to be in, and I can only... Uh, imagine how how awful that is and the, and the internal fight that goes on as you are potentially going through grief as to what people expect of you and how you're feeling uh, and being able to carry those two things at the same time and and maybe have never gone through grief at that level and so you, your body your whole body and mind are totally out of whack because because you haven't experienced anything like this uh, before. Uh, extraordinary, I can't imagine. Uh, Greg, what do you got on this one? I'm going to be really, really short because I'm going to say almost the same thing you said. What I see is a mixed message, and I'm not sure where it's coming from. I think it's helplessness or hopelessness, whichever it is. But he's doing what he needs to do to get the message out, and you can see it. I'll just leave it at that. And uh, Scott, what do you got? Yeah, I had helplessness and hopelessness as well. One right after the other, one slash in the other. So once again, we're seeing these head shakes. Uh, no, uh, some people are going to see think those are deception cues. Those are just confirmation shakes, as he, as he's saying, uh, as he's as he's talking. He zeroes in on one single thing. We just have to find her. That's it. At this point, that's all he's interested in doing is finding her. That's all he talks about. That's where his focus is. He hasn't talked about himself, about how he hadn't been sleeping. He's not talking about how what a wreck he's been. He's not talking about how horrible it is. He's not talking about how how their love for each other was this or that. And we've seen that quite often in other videos where the person was guilty of make, of that person missing. And we're not seeing that here at all. He, quite often, the the Guilty person will want you to feel sorry for him. Oh, that's horrible. He feels that way. Not this guy, because he. I'm under the impression so far that everything is the way it should be. Everything looks as it should, because he's not giving us any of that. He's not, oh, poor pitiful me, not giving us a bunch of pitiful mouth. He's just saying, this is what we need to do, is we need to find her. So that's where I'm sitting on that. Everything looks as it should. Everything is as it should be. Chase, what do you got? 
Yeah, so the request to get her back. Finally, the reporter is is kind of helping out here, essentially telling, just about to say this verbatim, like here's how to say this at the beginning of the clip. I think the request is genuine here, but the lack of emotion is unlike the stuff that we've seen before. This is potentially, I'll, I'll just give credence to the, the possibility this is maybe adrenal fatigue. But I also think there's a chance that like Mark said in video one, that we're seeing a lot of pessimism and a potential for maybe uh, giving up on the idea of her coming back. And this isn't in any way an insinuation of guilt or a character flaw. I think we all process things different ways and at different speeds based on our outlook on the world and how we view ourselves and the world around us. The eyewitness is you. And I think that's an important point to make because there might be some people watching this thinking why are you doing this why are you yeah. talking to us and the reason you're doing that i don't want to put words in your mouth is because you feel that somebody out there knows something and yeah. that's the appeal that you're trying to make yeah definitely definitely and i'm just pleading with with them just please anything anything no matter how tiny just please just come forward with it please because that is th that could be the key mm. to finding her and as a family we're not bothered about anything else like there's nothing else the only thing is we just have to find her you've told us a bit about um who nikki is was she ever the sort of person who might go away for a, a night or leave for a few days you know what i mean She's about as far out of character as you could get you know, I truly mean that. Like, even as a couple, um, on the odd occasion, if we ever do have a night away from the girls, because mm. the girls are our world. Like, mm. we go out for meals, the girls come with us. Um, our whole, family. Yeah. yeah, yeah, everything that we do is... Um, the girls are in it, they're involved in it. Um, and that's, that feels right. Mm. You know, that's how we love it. We love, we love our little family, we love our world. And your gorgeous dog, Willow, has been spending a bit of time with us as well. And it's also that thing that Willow may well have seen. I know, I know. To Nikki. I know, and, and, and that's another layer of, of, of frustration and, and hell to it. You know, it's a hellish situation with the layer of hell that no, not knowing what's happened yet. And then also having Willow, who probably does know mm. what happened, um, but she can't. She can't tell us, can she? And she's a very sensitive dog. Mm. Uh, I did take her back there first thing on the uh, on the Saturday. Uh, so the, day the after. next day. Well, the next day, yeah, I took her back there first. How thing. did she react to that then? Well, I was. Obviously, I was praying and hoping that once we got to the gate, that um, she would do something different, you know, just to give... Take you somewhere. Yeah, okay. yeah, just give some some sign of some kind. But she, bless her, she just went through the gate like any other normal day and ran into the field and looked at me excited that she was there for a walk. I was saying to her, where's mummy, where's mummy, you know? And she was just looking at me like, you know, let's go for a walk. Mm. All right, Chase, what do you got? I I can't imagine the just emotional hell of knowing that Willow, the dog, is also a family member, probably saw the whole thing and going to bed with her, looking into her eyes every night, knowing that she witnessed this thing. And Willow's a Springer Spaniel. They're incredibly intelligent. And if you'll forgive me, I'm going to stray out of the behavioral path for a stray. moment. For the first time, maybe ever. I don't know. If the dog happened to see something happening to Nicola, Willow, if it was violent or being abducted or something happening there to Nicola, Willow would have gone into full fight or flight mode. So if there was an attacker or something, this might explain the harness being 
disconnected from the dog or the harness coming off of the dog, which apparently from what I briefly read today uh, didn't happen. I just thought that was an interesting point. That's all I got here. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. Uh, I see what you're saying with that. And I actually saw, as I was scrolling through, looking for pictures to make the graphic for the video, I saw a couple of pictures of her by the lake or by that river, and the dog didn't have the the thing on it. So maybe they maybe she lets him lets her go, and lets her run around and stuff while she's on the phone, and maybe I'm just throwing that out there. Maybe there's that, but this is his chance <clears throat> to create doubt about why she's missing or why she may have left. This he could say, well, you know what. She's always talked about leaving me or she's always done this. So there was this one guy I think she was hanging out with. We don't see any of that. No, this is his shot, man. This is his, got that open window to go. Here's what I think. She she might have done this or that. Yeah. He doesn't do she he, he doesn't say that at all. The retelling of the taking of the dog, to, like you were saying, Chase, to the last place that she was seen is what most of us would do, you know, and that's a great idea and it's normal. But that's what I think is as he's reliving that, we're seeing stress build up from that. And that, and I think you're right. When he's hanging out with that dog, he knows that dog saw what happened. You know, if it was paying attention to what was going on around him. Um, yeah. And I think the mouth grooming we're seeing is just that. It's just some mouth grooming stuff. No no, no bitter taste, no pushing away. He's just licking his lips because he's been talking a lot. He's really she. focused on what's happening. Do what? She. No, he. I think, I think Willow's a girl. Yeah, yeah, but he's talking about the man licking his lips. I'm talking about the, the man now. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I moved on from, from dog to man. <laughs> I can, oh, well. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, so I think those things are, ju are just are just what they are. The deep breaths, again, in, indicate that he's he's feeling frustration. And he's getting rid of some of that uh, built-up stress and tension. And it's, it's a feeling of hopelessness. He has hopelessness and helplessness. He's going through this. I don't see any deceptive cues at all and these are only i would say cues of truthfulness as we go through because i think he's being honest we're not seeing anything that looks weird or odd or out of place in this uh situation greg what do you got i got one i got one that i think i i would scrutinize and that is when he says the when he's talking about this is as far out of character for her as anything could be he raises his brow that doesn't mean that he thinks she left, but it could mean that deep inside is there a possibility for him and he could be thinking that. So what I want you guys to all think about when you're watching this, if you're some Internet detective, because there's plenty of folks who solve crimes, that just because a person does something doesn't mean that they're hiding something. But a person can have feelings of uncertainty, certainly around this. And he said she would never leave the dog. She would never leave the children. Didn't say anything about himself. That was going to be something somebody seizes on. One person can't know another person's mind. We can't. With all our body language skills, we can't know. We can feel a certain way. But he's factual, to your point. And I look for clusters. I look for deviations and reasons why I should think that means something. And when he starts to talk about how things are working and he's editing as he speaks, look at his hands. His hands are in front of him working on exactly what he has to say. And then when he smiles, that smile is just punctuation for what he's thinking. At frustration, when he says frustration, look at the disdain. Mark, you always say contempt is for people, disdain is for the situation. Great call. That raised upper right lip shows us something's going on there. And then his brow up is, did it, when he took her back there, this guy had confidence this dog was going to do something. Chase, my experience with Springer Spaniels was very different from yours, clearly. I had the dumbest dog on earth one time who was a Springer Spaniel, who I would have to go into the surf and get so she didn't drown, just to give you an idea. What was her name? And, uh, I can't, Cassie, Cassie. And this verbal click here at the end is disappointment that the dog couldn't help is all I think it is. I don't think there's anything profound in here, but I would pay attention to that request for approval when he says that's so totally out of character for her. Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, exactly the same frustration, the disdain uh, happening there. Uh, the the imagery here, or the metaphor, hell and hellish. Again, it's put hell is full of pain and chaos, and so he's not not able to to put words to the feelings, but can give you an an image that hopefully you can attach to of hell and and hellish. He says some sign at the end of it, and we get a collapse of the gestures, and we hear that collapse hit his legs in a loud slap, but just as you were saying there, Greg, about that vocal click as well, I'd say that is disappointment and resignation. Um, and, you know, difficult to see in this situation because we have this idea that he's put forward of, of hope. And at the same time, we have disappointment and, and resignation happening uh, at, at the same time. Now, it's not, it's not to say you can't have the two things at the same time. And, and at some point, hope will come more forward and sometime resignation and disappointment will become uh, more forward. But, but it is the two things at the, at the same time that he's grappling with, which again is tricky for the body and mind to deal with. The body and mind, like one thing, like the body and the mind is lazy. It just likes to do what it can do lots of different things, but it doesn't like to. So it likes, it likes, you know, one track. And here he's grappling with two very uh, dissimilar ideas. And, and so, you know, in my mind, I'm seeing somebody keep quite a calm and and repose and really manage this situation actually very, very well, given the imagery that he's using as to how he's feeling at this time. The eyewitness is you. You've told us a bit about um, who Nikki is. Was she ever the sort of person who might go away for a, a night or leave for a few days? You know what I mean? It's about as far out of character as you could get. You know, I truly mean that. Like, even as a couple, um, on the odd occasion, if we ever do have a night away from the girls, because mm. the girls are our world. Like, mm. we go out for meals, the girls come with us. Um, our Your whole, family. Yeah. yeah, yeah, everything that we do is... Um, the girls are in it, they're involved in it. Um, and that's, that feels right. Mm. You know, that's how we love it. We love, we love our little family, we love our world. And your gorgeous dog Willow's been spending a bit of time with us as well. And it's also that thing that Willow may well have seen. What I know, I know. To Nikki. I know, and, and, and that's another layer of, of, of frustration and, and hell to it. You know, it's a hellish situation with the layer of hell that no, not knowing what's happened yet. And then also having Willow, who probably does know mm. what happened, um, but she can't. She can't tell us, can she? And she's a very sensitive dog. Mm. Uh, I did take her back there first thing on the uh, on the Saturday. Uh, the, the, day the, after. the next day. The what? next day, yeah, I took her back there first. And how thing. did she react to that then? Well, I was. Obviously, I was praying and hoping that once we got to the gate, that um, she would do something different, you know, just to give... Take you somewhere. Yeah, yeah, just give some some sign of some kind. But she, bless her, she just went through the gate like any other normal day and ran into the field and looked at me excited that she was there for a walk. I was saying to her, where's mummy, where's mummy, you know? And she was just looking at me like, you know, let's go for a walk. Mm. There's been a lot of publicity around um, Nikki's disappearance, isn't there? And um, I suppose you are one of those stories that is very much talked about on social media at the moment. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know whether you've read the stories, the accusations, all the, all the theories that are out there. Does that upset you? Or are you happy that people are talking about and trying to find a solution. It would be upsetting, of course, if I let myself read it all. Don't get me wrong, I have seen some stuff. Most people have been amazing. Yeah. You know, you always got you're always gonna get that two percent of um people that for whatever reason, you know, say and and do not very nice things. Mm. But I don't wanna give any energy to that. Like my energy is just finding Nikki. Um I read one that said um, the, the police need to look at the partner. And I'm sort of like, well, yeah, that's the first thing that they do. Like, 
Of course it is. Yeah. You know, like I knew that that would happen. You know, on the, on on the first day. And you, I and I said, you expect that, don't you? Yeah. I expected that. I said to them, um, "Do it, and, and get that out of the way, and then focus on finding it." on finding her and focus on the rest of it. So that's exactly what we did, you know. It was, um, that was done, ruled out, obviously, um, and then move on. So, you know, whatever, you know, people want to say and, uh, you know, if, if that's what they want to think, that's their business. It's not It's not mine. All right, Chase, what do you got? Yeah, it shows some contempt here and anger in his facial expressions for the people who are being hateful online. I think I would too. That's all I got. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, exactly the same. Uh, of course it is. Uh, you know, gives a double shrug there. Um, if I was worrying about him, I would want to see a single shrug on, of course it is. Yeah, because I was oh, something up there, double shrug. Yeah, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Of course they're going to come and look at me first. Of course, absolutely. Then that was done, obviously. And great glare there in his eyes and an eye roll and and contempt <laughs> at the same at the same time um for you know for those who don't think it's obvious that uh that he's not involved uh greg what do you got on this one yeah i'm just going to use i'm going to reiterate the one you said this is the single most powerful non-verbal in the entire video when he does the eye roll with the widening of the eyes and a slack lower jaw and the contempt He's just illustrating how absurd it was that they came to him. That usually you don't see in guilty people. So it's a powerful, powerful message. Scott, what do you got? Oh, yeah, you guys pretty much nailed it. Uh, but I think as as far as the huge cues that you'll see as the, a person just beginning to get into this, you're going to see him chew the side of his mouth. That's a big, huge cue outside of the baseline we've seen so far. Pretty much we saw a little bit earlier, but not as big as this one. And this lets, lets us know where it indicates that he's angry about these accusations that, that he's read online and he's seen some of them. How could you not, how could you not do that? But he, again, that goes back to being frustrated at the same time. He were seeing him a little bit more settled in to where he's sitting. He's back to his almost to, to point one on his, on his relax. Even though he's a little bit angry, he looks a little bit more relaxed or like he did at the beginning. He's back to his comfort zone for the question. And, and then um, as, as the question is being asked, we see him, he almost blinks the whole way, but he catches himself and doesn't blink the whole way. Then when it hits the part about the accusations, he blinks his eyes and he closes his eyes and it stays blinked, I guess you'd say, a little longer, or a lot longer than any blink we've seen so far. So he's letting that register. He knows what it is, and that's him getting mad. And I don't think this is one of those guys that pops off and gets angry because usually if somebody does that, they go, They'll close their eyes and you'll see the teeth and that head will go sideways. But in this, we don't you see the eyes close a little bit. So I, I don't see this guy's personality type is like popping off and getting angry or anything. Um, his illustrators are smooth and they're still fairly plentiful. Uh, everything is sounding the way it should. His voice, tone, and cadence are back to the baseline that we've, we're used to seeing. Everything looks the way it should, sounds the way it should, except for that little bite in the mouth there and the eye blink thing. I think we're are pretty much on the same page. The eyewitness is you. There's been a lot of publicity around um, Nikki's disappearance, isn't there? And um, I suppose you are one of those stories that is very much talked about on social media at the moment. Uh, I'm, I, I don't know whether you've read the stories, the accusations, all the, all the theories that are out there. Does that upset you? Or are you happy that people are talking about and trying to find a solution. It would be upsetting, of course, if I let myself read it all. Don't get me wrong, I have seen some stuff. Most people have been amazing. Yeah. You know, you always got, you're always going to get that 2% of um, people that, for whatever reason, you know, say and, and do not very nice things. Mm. But I don't want to give any energy to that. Like, my energy is just finding Nikki. Um... I read one that said um, the, the police need to look at the partner. And I'm sort of like, well, yeah, that's the first thing that they do. Like, of course it is. Yeah. You know, like I knew that that would happen, you know, on the, on, on the first day. And you, I and I said, you expect that, don't you? Yeah. I expected that. I said to them, um, do it and, and get that out of the way and then focus on finding it. 
on finding her and focus on the rest of it. So that's exactly what we did, you know. It was, um, that was done, ruled out, obviously, um, and then move on. So, you know, whatever, you know, people want to say and, uh, you know, if, if that's what they want to think, that's their business. It's not, it's not mine. But I know you've also been struck by the amazing response yeah. locally. And, you know, just being here for, for today, yeah. everybody's talking about it. Everyone's asking how you are. And the local community, whether they're standing out on the street corner or putting posters up or just asking questions, yeah. they are doing an, an amazing job. Yeah. It's absolutely incredible. Like, the heart, it's, it's heartwarming. Mm. It's given us an immense amount of strength and, and it's kept that, that hope so high um, that we, we, can't, like, we can't thank them enough. How are you keeping it? Is, it is, is that the kids? Is that your natural positivity? It's all of those things. Of course it's the, of course it's the children, of mm. course. But I am naturally a positive person and I believe that you get out of life what you put into life. Mm. And that's, that's how we are as a family. And so what we're going through now is like unprecedented hell but that hope and that positivity in me is, is stronger than ever and I'm never, ever going to let go. Nikki would never give up on us, ever. Mm. She, she wouldn't give up on anybody. And we're not going to ever give up on her. Like, we're going to find her. Hey, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, this is what I call emphatic message number two. She would never give up and neither will we. This is a second message that uses the same body language, the same pitch, tone, and cadence of telling, 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 the same emphatic body language, the same emphatic words, that chin up again. This is just like the one where he was saying earlier, um, she would never have done this and that kind of, oh, no, we need to search the entire earth. So here's the second emphatic. This is a big deal because he's only this emphatic, only showing anger when he's trying to drive home a point. And there's one thing that points to his hopelessness. When he says they have kept that hope, he almost uh, he just drifts off when he says so high. That is the only place where he changes his tone. And I think it says something about how hopeless he's feeling. It's really sad to watch. Uh, Chase, what do you got? Same stuff. I'm hoping for a miracle for this family. I'm done. Yeah, that's all I got. Mark? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is a lead up to, to our, our, our next video for me, where he gives what I would call is a belief statement, which is important for the next thing that he says in the next video. But he says, you get out what you put in. You get out. That's a belief because we know that's not always the case. Sometimes you put in a lot and you don't get anything out. But he says emphatically, you get out what you put in. He's gonna bring that back in our next video and it's incredibly important as to why he does that and also what that allows us to understand about him and, and, and any relationship that he has to this disappearance. Scott, what do you got on this one? Here's his chance to go into redirection to make it about him. And he doesn't even go near it. That's his shot right there. It's it's wide open. He can go right in and do it, but he doesn't do it. I, I feel so bad for this guy. So that's all. I'll leave it there. Everybody's pretty much covered the main thing. The eyewitness is you. But I know you've also been struck by the amazing response yeah. locally and you know just being here for for today yeah. everybody's talking about it everyone's asking how you are and the local community whether they're standing out on the street corner or putting posters up or just asking questions yeah. they are doing an, an amazing job yeah it's absolutely incredible like the heart it's, it's heartwarming mm. it's given us an immense amount of strength and and it's kept that that hope so high um that we we can't like we can't thank them enough how are you keeping it is it is, is that the kids is that your natural positivity it's all of those things of course it's the of course it's the children of mm. course but i am naturally a positive person and i believe that you get out of life what you put into life mm. and that's that's how we are as a family and so what we're going through now is like unprecedented hell but that hope and that positivity in me is, is stronger than ever, and I'm never, ever going to let go. Nikki would never give up on us, ever. Mm. She, she wouldn't give up on anybody, and we're not going to ever give up on her. Like, we're going to find her. 
there is a chance, isn't there, that somehow she might be out there even, even watching this. If you could say something to her, what would you say to Nikki now? <laughs> Just how much, how much I love her, how much us as a family love her and need her, how well thought of, how much her friends love her um, and need her back. Um, and we're never, we're never going to be the same and, until, until she is back. Mm. Just come home. Are you going to be okay? I will, as long as she, as long as she comes home. But yeah, I have to be okay for the children. Um, but obviously, the hope, the hope inside me that that well that she's going to come home. That I, I can't let myself. You know, think of anything else. It's, it's n it isn't an option in my head. Mm. Um, we we deserve we deserve a happy ending to all of this. You know, uh, you can't you can't have this level of support, this level of love, and compassion, and and hope, and prayers, without getting a reward from that. In my mind, that is impossible. You know, when you think of all the hope and everything and that's going out there, it has to, it has to come back. She ha and, and and that has to bring her home. I really appreciate you talking to us. I know it's impossibly difficult. You've described your life at the minute as as a living hell. I hope what you said makes a difference as well. And I think everybody watching this will join me in saying that we all hope that Nikki comes home and that she is safe and well and you can be back together yeah. thank you thank you Paul right, Mark what do you got yeah sad it's 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 uh it's tragic this for me is the biggest uh break in baseline uh that question are you going to be okay look at how long he takes over that look at how he's searching for the answer to that and what he comes up with is this value statement of you get out what you put in the belief and the faith that you you can't have that level of input without the reward yeah we deserve we put in so much the community everybody has put in so much that we deserve the reward of getting her back it is impossible that we don't get that payoff that's a belief and and you know i truly hope that fairness and reciprocity of that action in pays off but what it is 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 a true belief and faith in reciprocity you get in you get out what you put in i hope that becomes true for for him and his family uh, greg what are your thoughts yeah, I'm hoping for the best for this family. I'm going to tell you that there's a whole lot of stuff here that people are going to jump on. And I, I see it myself. And I'm going to tell you why I hope this is. But there's a hmm. That's an odd thing for him to use in this thing. It's almost like a little snort. And then there's a half smile. That's a little odd compared to his entire baseline. Now, there could be reasons. It could be skepticism or pessimism at the idea that this is happening. But then there are two other things that make me go, wait a second, let's poke a little harder. He doesn't say we will find you. He just says, just come home. Why? That's a weird choice of words for this deep into this problem. I don't think this guy's got anything to do with whatever's happened. Maybe he just has some kind of suspicion because it's days in, there's no evidence. He brought up the fact there might be some objects if something had happened. Maybe he's got his own doubt, his own second nature humans are going to wonder about what did i do or maybe did something else happen and then when i go back at that request for approval at the opposite of her nature and then we deserve a happy ending i, I always like to be really certain this piece right here just makes me wonder is it just because he's having doubt uh, that maybe something could have happened that she could have left, but it's a weird choice of words and people are going to seize on this. I'm going to say, if you've got doubt in the back of your head, you would probably use these words too. And we don't know the guy's normal 
set point, you know, happiness set points, default negative, default positive. We can't tell any of that. So I'm not going to point at him because he's been so clear through here. I don't think he has any involvement in this whatsoever. And I would not point to him being a bad actor in any situation. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I agree with you. And I think directly to your point, I just think that that idea that there's a potential that she just up and left would be in anybody's head because we don't want to assume the absolute worst that might be assumed in anybody's head. And I think that might lend itself to the idea of the first statement of everything in the house was more organized and set up than usual that morning. Like everything was unusually smooth that morning. And as far as the, the rest of the statement goes, I'm a huge fan of covering the psychological vulnerabilities of guilty people. I'm skipping. Scott? All right. Some are going to be under the impression that he switched you with she. Because the beginner will see this, or the person just starting to get into this will be reading books. They'll be reading, reading, and trying to understand the differences in pronouns and she and you and, the, and how those things are mixed up as a person who's done something they shouldn't have done or talking about the person they might have done it to, the way that, that t- those tenses will change. But in this case, he does say you. He trades you with she, but that's because he's talking and answering to the interviewer. He's not, he said, what would you say to her? And he's telling him what he would say to her, but not saying it verbatim like he's talking to her. So let's keep that in mind as you go through this. That's so important because some people say, ah, here's what you missed. No, we didn't miss it. What happened is he's telling this guy what he would say to her as he's answering the question the way it was asked to him. The eyewitness is you. There is a chance, isn't there, that somehow she might be out there even even watching this. If you could say something to her, what would you say to Nikki now? <laughs> Just how much how much I love her, how much us as a family love her and need her, how well thought of, how much her friends love her um, and need her back. Um, and we're never we're never going to be the same and, until until she is back just come home are you going to be okay i will as long as she as long as she comes home but yeah i have to be okay for the children um but obviously the hope the hope inside me that that well that she's going to come home that I, I can't let myself you know think of anything else it's, it's it isn't an option in my head mm. um we we deserve we deserve a happy ending to all of this you know uh, you can't you can't have this level of support this level of love and compassion and and hope and prayers without getting the reward from that in my mind that is impossible you know when you think of all the hope and everything and that's going out there it has it has to come back she and and, and that has to bring her home i really appreciate you talking to us i know it's impossibly difficult you've described your life at the minute as as a living hell I hope what you said makes a difference as well. And I think everybody watching this will join me in saying that we all hope that Nikki comes home and that she is safe and well and you can be back together. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So, Mark, what do you think we've seen up to this point? Yeah, here's what I'm going to say about this, is that um, if he has lost his... uh, his partner here and he's nothing to do with it he will be experiencing grief what you heard in that last video is what we call grief bargaining which is one of the stages of grief where you bargain to get the person back he literally says look we've done all this we deserve this back this is a classic talking to external entities that rule life for us in our minds and going, come on, we've done everything, play the bargain, we get her back. 
that for me is is absolute grief. I have no, uh, I've, I've, I can't see it any other way. Chase, what do you think? Yeah, this is a tragedy for him and uh, these little girls and wherever she is, I'm sure it is for her. There's a lot of media backlash about armchair detectives, which I think we maybe fall into that category. And I just want to add that over the last few decades, just thousands of cold cases and crimes were solved by online communities. And I think this is partly because it just presents an opportunity for law enforcement to gain lots of insights into cases that were previously inaccessible or too time consuming for them to pursue on their own. And I think a lot of times just picking up on clues or pieces of evidence that are overlooked by law enforcement, maybe just due to lack of manpower or resources. And I think in the end, there's a singular uh, police perspective. And then going outside of that, there's a thousand perspectives or tens of thousands in the armchair world. And some of which, of course, like everywhere in the world, are people who are just... Greg? Yeah, guys, I think this is one of the worst we've seen in a while. Let's hope for the best outcome. All we're doing is telling you what we can see based on our many years of observing people in multiple situations. And you can say, well, you've never lived in Lancashire. Yeah, we haven't. But what we can tell you is we've seen a lot of people under duress and a lot of people in situations. I'll tell you that what Chase just said boils. I am a big fan of proverbs and adages. Many hands make light work. The more people who look at things, the more opportunities you can get to see those things. What we're not telling is that we can read this guy's mind, not what we do at all. We're looking for symptoms. Those symptoms will indicate things we would look for. The reason I pointed out places where I saw stressors. Also, Mark said it best. He's in grief. Whatever caused that grief doesn't really matter. And when we're in grief and something like this happens, our brain is going to play on many tracks. So when you're looking, if you're a person who's saying, oh, he did it because of this, or even because of this last video, I want you to think about what else could be presenting itself as a result of that stress of having two children who do, do, no longer have a mother, of feeling all the stress of what happened, trying to figure all that out. That's what we're trying to point out. Scott, what do you got? Uh, yeah, I think this is a great example for someone who's just starting because they're actually getting to start from the beginning of seeing someone who isn't guilty of anything. He's not, he's not showing any deceptive cues. Everything looks the way it should. And that's, that's great. That's, you don't see that very often going back to what Chase was saying, we're dealing with armchair, you know, body language experts and detectives and stuff. And the thing about those are, I'm, I'm glad they have those. I really do. Um, and enjoy that because I remember, as we all do, I remember being little and 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 hearing things and seeing things and saying, oh, I think they're seeing things on the news back in you know a long time ago and going, I, I don't think this guy did it, not knowing why, but just saying he looks like he's not being honest to, to me. That people like doing that, and I th I, I, th I like what we're doing, trying to help them become what they want to become. They want they may not want to go into it as deep as we do, but a lot of them do, but they want to have part of that in their tool kit on their tool belt to be able to to reach in there and go okay here's what we're dealing with at a meeting at uh, at lunch at something else there are some people in there who are just mean you know who like you're saying chase i agree with you some people are just just mean and, and they're use it more for trolling you know and they're not really they just hear some things and go ah to get attention we know that happens because we see that in the comments sometimes but I'm I'm on the side of the of, of a lot of those people, a lot of the the armchair body language experts and the beginners, as we all are, because we train them. We like being around them. We like talking to them because when you see that light up in their face and they go, "I get it," There's nothing like that, you know. Be it police officers, military, us, yeah. uh, you know, dentists or healthcare. I think that's great when they do that because they can use what what they get from us. They can take it back and use it and tell their friends. When when that starts happening, though, things start getting watered down, and you and you lose a little bit of the the validity of a lot of things. But still, if, they, if they're interested for real, they can go back and learn from these people we talk about: Joe Navarro, Paul Ekman, um, Pease, everybody that that we talk about on here. So I, I, you got to watch out for the ones who who aren't coming in into it from a good place; they're coming to, to from a bad place and, and want to do want to troll with it. But everybody else, I I, I agree with you guys. I, I think that that that's good. You know, I think it's good. And I do feel sorry for this guy. And I hope things turn out better. I hope she's run off with somebody for those little kids. I hope, I hope, 
you know, maybe she's got knocked in the head is walking around the woods and wakes up and goes, good Lord, what's going on? The odds of that happening aren't very good, but you know, hopefully it'll, it'll turn out better than we foresee it turning out, I guess. All right, fellas. I think this was another good one and we'll see you next time. See you all. Keep your eyes open in the UK. What do you got?